Okay, thanks for the mic check. Tonight again, Lord Willing, uh, I want to take a look at another area. We'll look at, let's see, tomorrow. And the verse that I'm interested in here is Matthew 6, verse 34. So I'm going to use that as a target verse. Bear with me one second. First we'll look at the day of the Lord, and then we'll get into the, the day after, the tomorrow. Now, I think you might agree that the day of the Lord, let me post the, the heading. If we allow the Bible to define the terms, carefully comparing scripture, right? The day of the Lord, I think, is revealing Christ, both on the judgment side as well as salvation. Anyone disagree with that? Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for itself, for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day. Actually, that's not the target verse. We'll look at the, the whole topic of the day after or tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Who is the day? One thing, Lord willing, uh, we want to keep in mind, and we've discussed this before, is that everything in the Bible is pointing to whom? Everything in the Bible is pointing to Christ, correct? So it's not surprising to see the day, the day of the Lord, is talking about judgments that God executes in Christ. Whether it's the day of salvation or as it relates to the believers coming out of Babylon or the day that is anti-Christ, those that are coming looking like Christ. They too, they are said to be the day in the sense that God is, that's the time when God is judging the church. Psalm 118.24, this is the day the Lord hath made. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with looking at the outside and then seeing the sun, the moon, the stars. This is the day God is glorified in the creation. But spiritually, though, that is not talking about the celestial body. It's not talking about the a literal day, but rather it is pointing to Christ himself, correct? So this is the day. Let us rejoice. Rejoicing in the day. Hey, discipline. Welcome. Rejoicing in the day is to rejoice in Christ. So can you see how this would relate to salvation? The redemption of the body or the salvation of the elect? Because joy also is Christ. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time, now is the day of salvation. The day of salvation, the time when Christ is dwelling in the midst. Christ is a part of the church. But there would come a time when he would depart from the church. And that would be the day of the Lord in the context of judgment. Now is the day, the time of salvation, the day of the Lord, the appointed time, the time accepted. Uh, one second. Isaiah 49 verse 8. In an acceptable time have I heard thee. And in a day of salvation, that's Christ. The day of salvation have I helped thee. Now keep in mind that there are two uh, ways of looking at salvation. There is a salvation which is a sealing, 
of the 144,000. Many are called, but few are chosen. And then there's the salvation, the collective salvation, the gathering coming out of Babylon. Very important uh, that we make that distinction. Now, in Isaiah 61, verse 2, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And that, too, is another word, I think, that is pointing to Christ. Remember when we talked about a thousand years? And I offer that that's looking at Babylon, the day, the years, the months. All of these parabolically are pointing to Christ. Uh, but yet in judgment, it becomes Antichrist. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in the day of vengeance. That's the day, of, you know, Christ is said to be judging the world. But we know from the rest of the Bible that he uses a third party. He uses Babylon. He uses Satan, Antichrist, the men of renown, the locusts. So the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Now notice the the duality here. You have judgment and then also salvation. Now something that we talked about, I, I've offered the at least the concept that you know there there can't be salvation without judgment. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And I don't think that's talking specifically the to the shed blood of Christ. It is the, the death of the church, the fact that Babylon falls, that allows the believers now to uh, to come out of Babylon. But that's something that we'll, we'll have to try and expand a little bit further, maybe another time. So the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Matthew 6, verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, now look at the contrast here again. Today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. That, that's a time reference, I believe. That's in view. The grass is today, which is the day, the appointed time, the day of, I'm sorry, uh, the, the acceptable year, the day that God has made, Christ. Come unto me, all ye that labor. Uh, and also the there is a command to seek Christ. Today is the day of salvation. Prior to God uh, coming in judgment, shutting the door, uh, judging Babylon, and then redeeming the believers coming out of Babylon. So if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow. So that I think is important. Now we, this is a time reference. So tomorrow then must be looking at Judgment Day, right? And we'll come back to that. Zephaniah 1.15, the day, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness, desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and fake darkness. Now again, look at the day that is a day of salvation. That's Christ. Everything in the Bible is ultimately, I believe, pointing to Christ. And in the day of wrath is the day when Christ is revealed. Revealed to bring judgment on Babylon through Babylon and at the same time deliver the believers. All right. Um, now let's take a look at, these are just a couple of verses uh, to at least establish the setting looking at the day of the Lord. So then we see that there is a distinction made between the day or today. Today is the day of salvation. If God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, that I believe is talking about the church. God cares corporately for the body of Christ. Let both grow together until the harvest. So it's as if the whole body is saved and then comes judgment. So God clothed the grass of the field, looking at the, the corporate body, the church, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Well, how can that be if it's cast into the oven tomorrow? It means that the church was never really saved, with the exception of the believers. 
So tomorrow then must be pointing to the day of judgment. Judgment on the church and also redemption of the body. So it's always judgment and salvation. Judgment and salvation. Let's go back to Matthew 6.34. Again, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And then we look at Exodus 10.4. If thou refuse to let my people go, behold, I'm sorry, uh, be, yeah, behold, in the context of uh, God speaking through Moses unto Pharaoh, tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. Tomorrow will I bring the locusts into thy coast. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the day after. The day is Christ, tomorrow is the following day. Tomorrow, therefore, would seem to be pointing to the day of judgment, when God judges Babylon. Because the locusts identify with Babylon, right? Deuteronomy 28, 38. Thou shalt carry much seed out into the field, and shalt gather but little. For the locust shall consume it. When does that happen? Does that happen at the time well, when Christ is in the midst? Christ is a part of the body? I don't think so. Joel 1, chapter 1, verse 4. That which the palm of worm have left hath the locust eaten. Looking at God's judgment that was coming on the whole body of Christ, the collective body. Half the locusts eaten, that which the locusts have left, half the canker worm eaten. Hey, Margaret, welcome. So that which the palmer worm have left, half the locust eaten. So the locust tying into the day of the Lord, which is tomorrow, it is the day after. Behold, tomorrow, about this time, Exodus 9:18. I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as, now look at this phrase carefully, because it's a clue, I believe, again, it's a time reference. The hail is a time such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. So we search the Bible for this language. And we come to Matthew 24, 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not. See the similarity there? Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And also Mark 13, 19. For in those days shall be great, shall be affliction, such as was not. There it is again. Revelation 16, verse 18. There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. There's your May 21 earthquake that many people fail to see the spiritual nature of it. And it's talking about the great tribulation, God's judgment on Babylon. There were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as it was not since men were upon the earth. So, we never expected, or at least we should not, have expected a literal earthquake. You see how it is that sometimes when we're very quick to jump to conclusions in a Bible that is parabolic. So it's very easy to make, you know, costly mistakes. Not just foolish mistakes, but, you know, also costly because, uh, you know, it, it's a big campaign, and many people, you know, they advertise, they spend their money. So it, it's not a light thing. Such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake. Joshua 3, verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. Tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. So again, we search the Bible. And both on the salvation side as well as the judgment side, I think we see 
how this would relate to the day of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 2 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, the wonders that God is doing. Now, notice, remember back in Egypt, God brought the, uh, the locusts, the hail, darkness, all of which, again, I believe was pointing to his judgment on Babylon. But it's not, you know, it is God who is responsible for the action. He is executing it, but he uses a, a messenger. Who is the messenger? Who is the messenger? Is it the believers? Or is it Antichrist? With power and signs and lying wonders. What is that talking about? Joshua 22, verse 18. But that ye must turn away this day from following the Lord, and it, it will be seeing ye rebel today against the Lord, that tomorrow he will be wroth with the whole congregation of Israel. Now they rebel. Notice the, uh, the, the latter part of the verse. Ye rebel today against the Lord. So they're rebelling. The church rebels against Christ. He is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made. And therefore tomorrow he will be wroth. Again, tying into the day of the Lord. The day after. We also read in uh, Matthew 6, verse 30, and I think I posted this verse before, but I want to take a look at some of the uh, other surrounding verses. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, today, the church identifies corporately with Christ. Christ, again, I believe he cared for the whole body to the extent that he even saw, at least looking at the body, the church, as if it was saved, as if everyone in the church was saved, corporately, right? But in reality, many are called, but few are chosen. So the, the ones that are truly saved are the, uh, the believers, the eternal bride of Christ. But notice again, the language today is, today is the accepted time, the day of salvation, and tomorrow it is cast into the oven. Tomorrow is judgment day. Tomorrow is the day of the Lord. God's wrath on, on Babylon. Lamentations 5 verse 10. Our skin was black like an oven because of the terrible famine. Now here's another clue again I propose. Linking tomorrow with famine or the, the oven being cast into the oven because of the terrible famine. Well, it is the famine, the heat uh, of God's wrath that is bringing the that is bringing the church into this uh, this time of judgment. Psalm 21 verse 9, thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in the time of thine anger. So tomorrow identifies again, I believe, with the time of God's anger. Anyone disagree with that? Second Peter 3.10 The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. There is the heat, the oven. Again, tying into tomorrow. Today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. If God so clothe the grass of the field. Malachi chapter, five, chapter 4 verse 1. Behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Do you see the reference to tomorrow there? And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And I propose there again that the wicked is not talking about the outside world. It's talking about God's people. That's a scary thought. That, that's frightening in itself, isn't it? And that's why, again, I believe many people fail to understand the spiritual nature of the Bible. The wicked, many people see the word wicked. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, the, the, the gays, the lesbians, the, the, the child molester, and, you know, everything under the sun 
outside of the church. I'm not wicked. I'm not as wicked as they are. But I don't think God is interested in that. God is interested in the the wickedness that is going on in the body, the, the hypocrisy. Thus saith the Lord, many people, many shall come in my name, saying, I am. So it's all about how faithful the church is. 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Uh, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Tomorrow. Tomorrow pointing to the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. Tomorrow we die. They that dwell therein shall die in like manner. Isaiah 51 verse 6. So when does the church die? When does the church come under the wrath of God? Anyone? When does that happen? Today or tomorrow? It happens tomorrow. Tomorrow, the day after. Um, Jeremiah 27, 13. Why will ye die? So death is spiritually pointing, I believe, to God's judgment on Babylon. Thou and thy people by the sword. And notice uh, the reference again to the famine and the pestilence. When does that happen? Well, it begins with the Great Tribulation, judgment beginning at the house of God. Ezekiel 18.31, cast away from all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new spirit, a new heart and a new spirit, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? I mean, it's hard to see how, you know, we can actually miss this. If God's reference for judgment, it is always pointing right back to the church. God's uh, method of judging Babylon, or his judgment in general, it is pointing spiritually to the death of the church. Ezekiel 33, verse 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his way and live. Who is the wicked? As the church, as Babylon. Those that are coming in the name of Christ. They say, I have dream, I have dream. God has spoken to me. Many shall come in my name, saying, I am, and shall receive many. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Uh, Proverbs 27, verse 1. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. You don't know what tomorrow is going to bring forth. Well, we know that it is the day of the Lord. But the church doesn't know that. The church, judgment comes on the church unawares. And they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. So can you see how we, we get the idea? And of course, morally, I think it's, it's fine. That there's nothing wrong with that. You know, when you and I, we talk, we talk about tomorrow, we say, then, you know, Lord willing. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. That's the, the, the literal or the moral way of looking at it. But spiritually, though, that tomorrow there, again, I believe it is pointing to what happens tomorrow. Now, did the church anticipate judgment? No. And that, that's a scary thought. Because judgment comes unawares. It's a spiritual judgment of God destroying Babylon, but yet no one was aware of it. No one knew, not even the believers. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels in heaven. That's the church. Neither the Son, who is that? I think that's talking about the believers, the elect, but the Father. So God was aware. God knew that judgment had to do with the um, invasion of the locusts, the false prophets, the death of the church, destruction of the body. The believers were not aware of it, but then they are made to be aware of it when? 
when does that happen? Well, when Christ is revealed to them, correct? When God unseals the Bible today, by God's grace, I think, you know, being able to understand so much that is spiritual in nature, in a world that is lost, the the path of Christ, the the, the understanding of, of the Bible, the understanding of uh, what judgment and salvation is. So tomorrow, redemption of the body. Let's look at a couple of uh, salvation verses. Still, I mentioned earlier that tomorrow is the day when God judges Babylon. But it's also the day when God redeems the church. He redeems the believers. He brings back your captivity. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And he saith unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the Sabbath. Now, who is the Sabbath? That would have to be Christ again, right? Christ is the Sabbath. He is the resurrection. He is the beginning and the end. He is the great I Am. He is the day. So tomorrow is the rest of the Sabbath. So not only does judgment come, does judgment come on the on the church tomorrow after the day of salvation, the day of Christ, the day of the Lord, uh, and as far as being the, the acceptable time, and now it is cast into the oven. The grass of the field is cast into the oven. Exodus 9, verses 5 and 6. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. What did he do? What did God do? Notice here. And all the cattle of Egypt died. Now what is cattle talking about spiritually? What is the reference to cattle? All the cattle of Egypt died, but the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. You see that? So there is a separation. The cattle pointing to people. Yeah, yeah. Cattle is talking about, I believe, those in the church, those that are a part of the body of Christ. Many are called, but few are chosen. So the cattle of Egypt, that would have to be talking about the false prophets, Antichrist coming in the name of Christ. They remain blind, uh, in blindness, I'm sorry, in darkness. They are blinded. They don't see the truth. They don't see Christ. But the cattle of the children of Israel died not. Why? Well, because God, Christ, is revealed to them. Why? For the purpose of separating the wheat from the tares. Number 16, verse 5, And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even him whom he have chosen, Will he, come, will he cause to come near unto him? What is that? What do you see there? What do you see there? Can you hear me, Mike? You got sound? Oh, okay, good. So what do we see there in number 16, verse 5? Tomorrow God will cause, the Lord will show who are his, and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him, even whom he hath chosen, will he cause to come near. That's the language of salvation, isn't it? Coming near to God, and God is, uh, Christ is revealed through the Bible. The believers, they see him face to face. Babylon, they're told, is fallen, come out of her, my people. Joshua 3, verse 6, Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. I, I posted that verse earlier, but again, I wanted to uh, 
share it again, share it here as a reminder. So we see tomorrow the Lord will do wonders. Hebrews 2 verse 4. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders. Signs and wonders. And then finally, Proverbs 3, verse 28. Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. Now that, that's a very uh, complex verse, I think. But, Lord willing, uh, it is referring to the, the command that God gives to the church. You have to feed the flock feed the flock. God first is looking to the church. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Remember Cain asked the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? But he killed Cain. He rose up in a field. They were in a field. He rose up and he killed Cain, his brother. And that's a picture, again, I believe, of the, the church, the false prophets, spiritually killing the two witnesses, silencing them. Even though they were commanded, they had to provide, they had to be the kinsman redeemer. But because the church failed to do that, God is the one who stepped in and became the redeemer of his people. So go and come. Uh, say not unto thy neighbor. Thy neighbor again is someone who is also of the body of Christ. Now, it's not talking about your next door neighbor. Morally, perhaps it is. But I don't think there's any you know, command that you and I, we, we have to give to someone who is in need, a neighbor or someone who's uh, asking for you know, a handout in the street. And then somehow maybe you feel guilty that you, you don't help the person out. Have you sinned? Have you violated this command? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's what God is talking about here. The neighbor, it is those that are in the church. A man's foes, a man's enemies will be they of his own household. So God is looking to the church. Well, don't say that, okay, well, you go tomorrow, I will give. Remember what I mentioned earlier? Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The church didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. The church died. It came under judgment. So today you can be here and then tomorrow you die. Let us eat and drink because tomorrow we die. So tomorrow is spiritually pointing to, I believe, the, the death that comes on the body of Christ, on the church, unawares. Sudden destruction coming upon them, unawares. So say not to thy neighbor, go and come again and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee. So again, this I think is tying into the command, feed the flock, feed the flock. The pastors feed not the flock. God is looking to the, the, the body, to care for the body, to be the kinsman redeemer. And it all has, it's all again pointing to uh, forgiveness. How do we forgive others? By being faithful to God's word. If we're faithful to God's word, it means that we are offering Christ. We're offering salvation. But if we're not faithful, we are spiritually, what? We are spiritually killing. So we're not forgiving. Forgiveness is salvation. Can you see that? That to me, I think, is amazing. Forgiveness is salvation. If you're offering someone salvation, you can't do it with a false gospel. You have to do it with the truth. Now, although, if we're talking about, you know, being saved, we also understand that it's God who does the saving, correct? So, when someone is in a church, for example, a pastor, and they're sharing the gospel, uh, I think as long as they're reasonably faithful, they're talking about the cross, the death, uh, and resurrection of Christ, the blood of Christ, God, I think, can use that to save someone, even though uh, they themselves may not be saved. But that's because Christ is the one who does the saving. But when Christ departs, he departs from the body. He is taken out of the midst, 
now the church is no longer faithful. Now the pastors, they, they speak a vision of their own mind. So because they're no longer faithful, now they, they are bringing lies. They're not bringing Christ because Christ is not there. So they can't forgive, right? Hopefully that makes sense. All right, here's the conclusion that I'm offering. God appears very short. God appears to be relating both today and tomorrow to Christ. The day being the day of salvation, Christ is the day, and tomorrow to his judgment on Babylon. However, both in judgments, both with judgment on the church, comes also the redemption of the elect as God brings them out of Babylon. Any questions? All right, hold on one second.